This video is brought to you by the Logitech Lightspeed wireless range of keyboards, mice and headsets, the benchmark in wireless gaming performance. Rewind with me back to the turn of the century. The next generation of console gaming was in its infancy, following the arrival of the Sega Dreamcast and the promise of PlayStation 2. But Rare was still toiling away on its latest Nintendo 64 titles. Perfect Dark was set to arrive that summer after multiple delays, while the once family-friendly Conker 64 was being transitioned to Conker's Bad Fur Day, which would arrive the following year. But it was perhaps Dinosaur Planet that was most exciting. Magazine articles teased a multi-character Zelda-style action-adventure game set in a beautiful dinosaur-inhabited world. It was shaping up to become one of the largest games Rare had ever produced, but before it reached the finish line, the N64 version was cancelled and development was shifted to the Nintendo GameCube where it became known as Star Fox Adventures. Recently, however, a surprisingly complete build of Dinosaur Planet for Nintendo 64 was found and released, allowing us to visit a world that most of us only experienced on paper. With this news then, I felt it was the right time to not only take a closer look at this unfinished release of the game, but also reflect back on Star Fox Adventures for the GameCube itself. As Rare's final big release for a Nintendo home console, Star Fox Adventures is one of the most technically advanced games on the platform, and thanks to the release of this N64 build, we can now more easily appreciate its path to completion. So today we'll discuss that leaked build, compare and contrast with the GameCube version, hear from one of the developers that worked on the game, and highlight the impressive technology powering Star Fox Adventures itself. So, let's get started. This is Dinosaur Planet, running on a Nintendo 64. This build originates from late 2000 and features a large amount of content, albeit buggy content, in this state. But before we dive into what it is, we should examine where it comes from. In many ways, it begins with Rare's well-regarded Diddy Kong Racing. You see, many of the people that worked on this game are the same people that would go on to create Dinosaur Planet. But there's a deeper connection there that begins with the characters. When we finished DKR, we were going to take that main character again, the, the tiger, and we got an idea. It was a, a dinosaur land, and we called it, we just kept calling it Dinosaur Planet. The tiger in question has played a role in Rare's history, first created for an unreleased adventure game where he would have been a four-legged tiger wearing a ball cap and a rucksack, he made his debut in Diddy Kong Racing before being planned as the main character for Dinosaur Planet. We said we'll have um, a baby version of the Triceratops that you raced against on uh, Diddy Kong Racing and the tiger with a, a backpack and a lot of adventure bits and pieces on him and uh, we'll run around this level and we'll fight dinosaurs and we'll map it all out. And we got so far with it and then for some reason again the tiger got pulled and we changed the tiger to a wolf this wolf goes by the name of saber you know saber wolf right well he was the face of dinosaur planet throughout most of its press cycle along with crystal the idea is that these two characters could be swapped between one another using a swap stone but of course in the leaked build of the game while saber is referenced by name his model was replaced by Fox McCloud, the leader of Star Fox that would become the main character in the final GameCube release. So how did that come about? We went to E3 and met with Nintendo and uh, they were impressed with what they saw, but they said, why, why do another? It doesn't make any sense to have uh, another game with a lead character, which is a, a wolf-like character especially if it's involving planets and um, different uh, space travel and, and landing on different planets and uh, lots of weird weird creatures so um, this is could we talk about uh, some sort of marriage between our characters and your character here and, and, and work together on this and make what became Star Fox Adventures. 
Of course, we now know that Fox McCloud had been created and inserted into the Nintendo 64 game. The leaked build of Dinosaur Planet basically shows a transition in development. Most of the dialogue still references the character as Saber, but during his introduction, the voiceover is that of Fox McCloud. I am Fox McCloud, Royal Knight of the Lilat system. I've come to take the prince back to his home. Hey, wait! Of course, then we had to rework all of the story um, and everything, that, and why these characters were together and how to introduce all of the new elements. So uh, I spent a week over in, in um, Kyoto um, and a few meetings over there with uh, Shigeru Miyamoto and um, we, we just talked about the, the story and what idea we'd got. So this planet was coming apart and we were trying to keep it all back together and there was dinosaurs on the planet and we just drew lots of pictures and worked out a story and then came back and says, right, this is what we're doing now. We remodeled the main character and turned it into Fox McClough and um, that was it. We, we, we continued with that and then of course it moved on to different console. So now we have a basic understanding of how development progressed. What started out as an experiment with a tiger as the lead character transitioned into something much larger in scope featuring two characters before being retooled into a Star Fox themed game and then redeveloped for Nintendo's next generation GameCube. Thanks to this leak, we can now finally gain a deeper understanding of the various shared elements between each version of the game, as well as the overall progress in this original iteration. Let's begin with the visuals. Dinosaur Planet is a game that shares much with late generation rare titles for the system. It requires the expansion pack, offers exceptionally high quality visuals for the platform, but it runs at a very low frame rate as a trade-off. What really separates this from many other N64 titles, I feel, is the richness of the texture work. Sure, it's still quaint by today's standards, but the amount of detail packed into each area is really impressive. I especially love details like this. If you look along the top area of this fortress, you'll notice an orange light reflecting off the upper structure. This gives it a real sense of depth, and it's the kind of thing you'll find throughout the adventure. Now, in comparison, Banjo-Kazooie, released much earlier in the system's life, features much simpler repeating texture patterns and less complex scenery, but even that was a step up from what most other third parties were delivering on the platform. Conker's Bad Fur Day is perhaps the closest analog in terms of what they've achieved here, but that game has its own unique visual design, and I feel that Dinosaur Planet looks even more impressive. Beyond this, Dinosaur Planet also offers dynamic time of day progression along with dynamic weather. This is then combined with surprisingly effective use of the N64's fog capabilities to produce these beautifully atmospheric environments. It's also worth noting that the game's ROM size is 64 megabytes, which is the same as Conker's Bad Fur Day. And like Conker, the entire game is voiced. Something we take for granted today, but it was a rare thing on the Nintendo 64. I'm sorry, Kite. I can't open the cage. It, it, it's okay. I'm not feeling too good anyway. This must I mentioned earlier that the game requires the N64 expansion pack, but this extra memory is no doubt reserved for expanding texture quality and map size, as the game doesn't utilize the system's high-resolution rendering mode, at least outside of the main menu, which is gorgeous. Based on the performance of N64 titles which did support high-resolution rendering, however, it probably makes sense that it was left out here as well. But still, despite the overall low frame rate, I do think that the game looks fantastic. But how much of this world can you visit in this leaked build, and how does it compare to the GameCube original? So this is where things get complicated. This build has a lot of content packed within the ROM, but much of it is inaccessible through normal gameplay. There is already a large community doing a ton of work reverse engineering and picking apart everything they can. New discoveries are being made all the time in fact, but if you just load up the leaked ROM on your EverDrive 64 or another flash card and start playing, the experience is rather incomplete. So for this section, I'm going to walk through the game from the beginning, comparing and contrasting with the GameCube version along the way. This also allows us to appreciate how the game design itself has evolved, as well as explore the visual techniques used on both GameCube and Nintendo 64. 
So Dinosaur Planet begins much like the GameCube title then. You're riding a dinosaur in the sky while doing battle in this third person shooter segment. On Nintendo 64, this entire sequence is letterboxed. For the GameCube, I am playing in 4x3 mode to better preserve the pixel aspect ratio, but this does support both 480p output and 16x9 widescreen. Eventually, you'll land on the ship before encountering general scales. In this build, the dialogue itself varies, but the cutscenes are remarkably similar in terms of overall scene direction and camera angles. It really allows you to catch a glimpse of how it has evolved on the GameCube. Character model complexity and texture detail is also ramped up significantly. We had already been pushing the textures on the character models quite a lot and everything was pretty expensive because we was at the end of its days of the N64, we were trying to throw as much at it as we could. Um, I remember as soon as we moved on to GameCube, we were able to implement a lot more in the way of almost like a physical shading um, texture or material. It, uh, it would allow us to have some sort of bump mapping on the characters as well as a specularity map and so the characters looked a lot more solid so I think then we did stop redoing textures to, to give everything a little bit more life because otherwise everything was just a, a solid baked texture but because we'd built everything in 3D we got all of the bits and pieces that we needed to um, to produce the textures again and split them up so because yeah. there, there is a lot of uh, lighting effects in, in Dinosaur Planet. Then there's the weather effects. This entire sequence showcases these on both platforms. I honestly think N64 holds up surprisingly well here, but the rain on GameCube is what really stands out. The multi-directional nature of the rainfall combined with the high frame rate enables a convincing effect that still holds up brilliantly. By now, you should have also noticed that the GameCube version operates at a full 60 frames per second. This is something we'll come back to as we discuss the game, but I feel it's one of its crowning achievements. It's not only pushing all sorts of fancy new techniques for the GameCube hardware, but it's doing so at a really high frame rate. So in terms of raw rendering workload, the screen resolution is four times that of N64, as is the frame rate. Now eventually you make your way to the Krizoa Palace. How and why you land here does vary between the two, but you do end up here all the same. As you can see, the exterior design of the palace does differ between them. On N64, you get this beautiful earthen temple design. Even at this stage, the time of day system is already in place as well. On GameCube, the temple takes on a very different appearance with a less natural design. It also introduces a puzzle element right away. You need to bypass these crates, but can't destroy them with your staff. Instead, you're taught to use these fuel canisters which pop up throughout the game. They're used to blow up destructible objects such as these crates, and this section teaches you how to use them right away. No such object really exists on the N64. Now, once inside the temple though, you will begin to notice some similarities such as this section here. Or perhaps this room where you engage the door by triggering the switch in a very Zelda style design. I was extremely impressed by the usage of lighting, texture, and fogging on Nintendo 64 here. It's a richly detailed temple environment that is a significant visual step up from, say, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I want to note at this point that as we examine the GameCube version of the game throughout the rest of this video, I'll be making use of the no-clip map viewer created by Jasper. I featured this back in my Water episode, and his hard work essentially allows you to browse through the map data of various games. Star Fox Adventures made the list. Using this tool allows us to look closely at different elements within each map and better understand how they were laid out. Okay, but it's at this point that the games begin to differ. In the GameCube release, Crystal must solve a series of puzzles before returning to this room. You then take the platform to the upper chamber, release the spirit, and get pushed into the beam where she becomes trapped in this crystal. With the N64 game, however, Crystal leaves the palace via a warp gate using a crystal that you picked up back in the chamber. From this point then, you're introduced to a warp stone via a cutscene. The original idea, as alluded to earlier, is that you use these statues to swap back and forth between Crystal and Saber slash Fox McCloud. So, Crystal was designed to be a fully playable character in this original design, basically sharing half the adventure with Fox, while on GameCube, you spend most of the game playing as Fox, so 
This is a significant change. Now on Nintendo 64, after this Warpstone cutscene, you're immediately warped over to Fox McCloud, mid-quest, here in this snowy region. We'll pick up our comparison here in just a moment, but there's a significant difference in the progression. After Crystal was trapped on GameCube, the game jumps to Fox McCloud and the rest of the team where the mission is laid out before them. From there, Fox jumps into his R-Wing and makes his way towards the planet via this Star Fox-esque shooting sequence. You're then dropped into Thorntail Hollow, which serves as one of the key areas for the game. This spot really highlights some of the technical improvements on display. For one thing, there's the fur and grass shading. It would seem that this technique employs the typical shell texture approach outlined in the real-time fur over arbitrary surfaces white paper made available almost two decades ago. This approach allows both fur effects on characters such as Fox McCloud, as well as grass. Many areas in Star Fox Adventures use this technique to provide proper depth for grassy surfaces rather than relying on a simple flat texture as they do on Nintendo 64. Using the no-clip map viewer again, we can place the camera in close proximity to the grass itself, which provides some insight into how it's animated. It's important to keep in mind how rare grass rendering was in games at this time. For a game to feature fields of animated grass was something we just didn't see often. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X, a launch title for the Xbox, did feature a similar type of grass rendering, but Star Fox's approach is cleaner and less static in comparison. It's really impressive stuff, I think. The water rendering also deserves a mention. It's used throughout this area and it looks great. It uses GameCube's render to texture feature to produce reflections. Basically, the scene is captured from a secondary camera and that data is used to feed the reflection. And this is then combined with this beautiful ripple technique. The render to texture feature is also used to create reflections across other surfaces besides water. Another standout visual feature I'd like to touch upon before we resume the comparison are the projection textures used to simulate light and shadow playing off character models. Note how when standing in this area, the pattern displays across Fox's character model. The same is true for this scene as well. This is applied to specific lights and bespoke scenes, but it's really convincing. There's even self-shadowing evident in certain scenes, such as during this boss fight, though the quality of the shadow rendering is relatively low quality. I feel as if these three visual elements really demonstrate the type of work being done on the GameCube during this era and really showcases what the system was capable of. To think that you get all of this running at 60 frames per second even. But okay, let's get back to the comparison. After completing a few tasks in Thorntail Hollow, you eventually encounter the Warpstone. But unlike the N64 game, you don't switch characters. He simply takes you to an entirely new area, which just happens to be the same snowy fields we saw on N64. This time though, we have another cutscene that lines up remarkably well. This is where players are introduced to Tricky, who Fox has been sent to rescue. I have a suspicion that scenes like this do share certain elements directly with the N64 game. Now obviously the map and characters and textures are all completely new, but look how closely the two ships compare to one another. This then leads into this smallish open snowy area for you to explore. There's a short puzzle to solve on the GameCube side, but both require you to open this door. After doing so, another cutscene plays, and once again, they're highly comparable. After the sequence plays out though, we hop on this jet bike thing and take off in pursuit. The concept is of course identical, but the map layout is completely new, while the handling has been adjusted. This is certainly one area that demonstrates the benefits of a higher frame rate, that's for sure, but I think it looks beautiful in both versions. Once you reach the bottom though, there's one more big cutscene that plays out, and that brings to end this specific sequence, which is shared between the two versions. At this point, you should have a good idea of how the game was modified in its final incarnation. 
It's an interesting situation as Rare basically had a chance to go back and remake the game based on what they had learned from creating it on Nintendo 64 in the first place. Now from this point, the GameCube maps are generally expanded. It has areas like this where you need to solve a puzzle in order to cross this spot, but there are similar sequences. This open snowy area again, for instance, is very similar. You need to feed this fellow right here in order to gain access to an ice block that you'll push to climb up into the next area. Next up is this area with the pentagonal platforms, and it is interesting to see how it's evolved since N64. The GameCube version features improved environmental details, an expanded view, improved water effects, and higher resolution textures, but it's still clearly derived from that N64 original. Of course, over here it's a dead end on the GameCube, but on N64 you use Tricky to dig a hole and move on to the next area. Eventually you'll come upon a snowy field area in both versions, though it is completely different. There are however some similarities, such as this guard which blocks the progress. You can bribe him on GameCube, but on the N64 version, there's really nothing you can do right now. From here, the games diverge almost completely, and similarities begin to dry up. So here's a few more comparisons. There's this grassy area, which slightly resembles Thorntail Hollow from the GameCube game, with the river running through it and the grassy plains, but it's clearly a different map. The shop, however, is available in both games and features the same shopkeeper and layout, though it can certainly vary from room to room. Cape Claw also exists in both games, with the same basic layout, but everything is expanded on GameCube. You can even find elements of Lightfoot Village on N64, including the puzzle required to enter, this large dome structure with the ladder you can climb on top of, a locked door, and even this hole. In its current form, it's interesting to examine just how much the world structure varies between the two. Star Fox Adventures is centered primarily around Thorntail Hollow, but you'll need to use your R-Wing to travel to some of the dungeon-like areas. On N64, however, things are completely different. It feels like when building the game on GameCube, they went back to the drawing board and completely overhauled and redesigned the planet layout. Some other events are shared, such as this point where you encounter Tricky's mom, but the placement of this event is completely different. Now, eventually on N64, you'll uncover this warp stone, which allows you to swap over to Crystal again, and this is where the game begins to break apart in its current form. Basically, Many of the event triggers don't seem to work correctly or cause crashing. You have to be extra careful with where you explore. For instance, in Cape Claw, you need to get past this guard to enter this area, right? Well, he requires a shiny object, one of which is hidden in a nearby cave. You're supposed to ride this log into the cave, but doing so triggers a crash, so modders have found various ways to work around it. I tried using a GameShark code that was discovered to give myself the necessary items to pass, and it worked. This leads to this gas room, which is also available on GameCube, but it's highly unstable and after completing it, the door never opened for me, so I couldn't progress. In fact, during one of my attempts, the game kept respawning enemies in this area. There's also this underground zone. On N64, you need to find white mushrooms for Tricky's mother, and this requires climbing down into this large tree trunk. And this same basic area also exists on GameCube, though its usage is different. Note the bridge over this area as well as the water below. It's very similar, isn't it? Of course, there's also completely new places such as this desert, which does not exist in the GameCube version. To access this area on N64, you have to wait for these brush things to grow on the trees, and once they fall, you whack them with your stick. Eventually, you'll hear a chime play, and then you can approach the door where a cutscene plays out, with Crystal placing an object, which you didn't have in your inventory, into the statue. It then rotates around, and you have access to the desert. Problem is, there's really not much to do in here. There's a dinosaur to talk to, there's this other area up here to explore where you get blown off, and you can just run around and check out all the beautiful sand dunes. It's a great looking spot. 
Near the end, however, there's this area that sort of resembles another area in the GameCube version, but if you interact with the enemy here, it crashes the game. So yeah, in its current form, you're not going to be able to progress very far, but as noted earlier, there is a community working very hard on solving this puzzle, so perhaps it will become more playable in time. Alright, so let's summarize some of the key points regarding the achievements on display in both games. This leaked N64 build suggests that Dinosaur Planet would have been one of the largest games produced for the system. It features massive, interconnected environments with excellent texture work for the system. Plus, the entire game is fully voiced. You also have that potent combination of dynamic time of day and fogging, allowing for some beautiful scenes. Clearly, however, this game would never have been able to run especially well. In that sense, I feel like it's a good thing that it was shifted to GameCube, at least overall. It runs at a high frame rate, features tons of advanced techniques targeting the new hardware, and the world itself is packed full of detail. It's also completely seamless, which is perhaps the most impressive achievement. The GameCube was Nintendo's first console based around an optical disc, and there was concern about how this would impact games, but Rare has managed to implement a high-speed data streaming solution that basically outperforms what they were doing on Nintendo 64. There's virtually zero visible loading to the user during normal gameplay. Perhaps part of this is tied to strategically building these transitional areas. For instance, this is the Thorntail Hollow map, right? It's fairly large, but there are multiple areas you can reach from this point. Each of these areas are connected by linking maps, which are smaller in scope and detail. It works both in terms of increasing the perception of a larger world, but also, perhaps, easing the streaming system. But of course, as impressive as this game was, it was also the last Rare game to ship on a Nintendo home console, which is a shame, I think. At the time, games such as Cameo and Perfect Dark Zero were also in development for the GameCube, but would be shifted to not one, but two different machines on the road to completion. As for this leak, well, that too is an interesting piece of gaming history that now has additional context behind it. It's also really just the beginning. It's fascinating in its current state, sure, but I'm more excited about how it could change in the future. For that though, we'll have to wait. But what about Star Fox Adventures itself? Looking back, it feels like the reception at the time wasn't as positive as I would have expected, and revisiting the game, I'm actually kind of surprised. The thing is, there aren't that many Zelda-style adventure games, and certainly not at the time, and it really is to Ocarina of Time as Banjo-Kazooie is to Super Mario 64. It's a sprawling adventure with tons of beautiful locations to visit and some really interesting puzzles to solve. Sure, it can get bogged down with item collection at points, but overall I think it's a really solid Zelda-style action-adventure game. It's disappointing that we lost the second half of the adventure with Crystal, but I still think it works with the Star Fox crew. But I think that's going to do it for this video. Hopefully you've enjoyed this tour through Star Fox Adventures and Dinosaur Planet. There are of course many other things we could talk about in relation to this game, but hopefully this is a nice, concise presentation. And if you made it to the end, thanks for watching. A breakthrough in design and engineering, the G915 features Lightspeed Pro-Grade Wireless, Advanced Light Sync RGB, and new high-performance, low-profile mechanical switches. Meticulously crafted from premium materials, the G15 is a sophisticated design of unparalleled beauty, strength, and performance. Meet G15 Lightspeed and play the next dimension.